welcome to the Human Broadcheck Podcast. Here we have inspiring stories worth spreading. I am your host, Karina Rosa Feigenberg. Because today my throat is really messed up. Oh, really? Yeah. Would there be anything we could sing together? Oh, Hotel California. <laughs> this is not opera. I know. You know Papageno? Yes, of course. This I cannot sing. Oh. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Of course I needed to find something I know. <laughs> you totally could. Okay, Papageno, how does it how does it sound? Ein Mädchen oder Weibchen wünscht Papageno sehen. Oh, so ein sanftes Täufchen wäre Seligkeit für mich. This is amazing. And that wasn't even that great. Oh, it was great. Oh, Here at this you. cleaning river in oh, the middle of nowhere. True. I sing to this river all day long. All day long. Who are you? Who am I? I don't know. I'm me. I'm you. I love that. It reminds me of what Schaft said. Yeah. So, what's your name? Where are you from? Mm. What do you do? For those who need a bit more kind of a crowning answer to not fly away to the moon. Clarity. Okay. My name is Anthony. <laughs> in short, clarity. <laughs> like, who am I in human form? <laughs> My name is Anthony in, hu in this physical form. In this physical form, I teach yoga and travel. And um, what? who am I? What do I do? <laughs> where are you from? Oh, where am I from? I am from America. Mm, the big country. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> <laughs> big can mean a lot of things. And can you tell us where we are right now? Mm, we are in Samuk Champe, Guatemala. This beautiful river, you can probably hear it if you're if you really tune in. The birds are coming out, the sky is falling, um, the sun is going to rest, and the moon is rising. Oh, I love this non crowning answer. <laughs> <laughs> you're so funny. Yeah, that was very woo woo. <laughs> <laughs> But it's true, it's like magical. It the two of us this place here. is poetic. It's really poetic. And you know yeah. that I saw you when I was walking down this little yeah. forest path. I saw you. And can you describe what you did when I came down? <laughs> It looked like funny. being Robinson Crusoe somehow, I trying to keep up his shape. So funny. I was on the phone with my mom and I was like, Mom, there's a girl taking pictures and I'm in the back <laughs> carrying a tree on my shoulders, doing squats with a tree, doing a workout. I'm like, this girl's going to have me in the back of her picture with a fucking tree on me. <laughs> Oh, you've like, spotted me. This oh, is it was so funny. Oh my gosh, I thought it was funny too because I was like, I've got to do these squats, but I'm like, literally, you were right over there, and I was like, oh, I'm right in her photo right now. I was like, this is not a good photo, but I'm glad <laughs> I got some good photos of you because it was amazing. Because here in front of this beautiful lake yeah. and seeing you, then yeah, brown, good shape, long hair, kind of yeah. a hippie bandeau in the hair. Yeah, well, I'm oh. trying to let it get really long but anthony you are as well you were an opera singer yeah how did this happen like now you're here you gave uh, up your opera career yeah yeah well i was i was literally in an opera in november and then january came i quit i quit singing and decided i wanted to dive into spirituality and so i came to the lake to do that and found my way over to this river where now I'm teaching yoga and it's it's a totally different lifestyle than I was living in America. I used to perform in New York City at Carnegie Hall and Lincoln You Center. did this? Yes. Really? Yes. Are you famous? No, I'm not famous. <laughs> What were you like known for? What kind of part for which kind of opera, which kind of I'm most known for singing choir. Okay, like, this is hard to perform right now because I'm not singing with you. I know. Mm -hmm. But do you have any solo parts? Um not mostly in the choirs, but we do have albums out on Spotify. How did it come that you I mean 
musician is something that is a kind of dedication. Maybe it's a calling even. Mm. Would you say it's just placed on hold and you're just trying to explore another part of your personality? Or would you say, no, this part of my life has had taught me a lot. And now I'll leave it behind. Mm. You remember, like, we met and I, we spoke about San Marcos. And mm -hmm. you know also Shaft, mm. one of the last interviews. And he said, like, he has been in the spiritual world for eight years. Mm. And now he has grown out. He has learned a lot. Also, it's dark sides. So would you say the same applies for you when it comes to being an opera singer you had that experience and your mind your curiosity is asking for more so for me classical singing and singing in general was a spiritual practice for me yeah. it was a form of meditation where i got to to learn about my body and my habits and my voice and how i use my body and my voice and so this is really I may go back to music someday, but this is a retreat into kind of separating the body and the voice almost and letting the voice go and really analyzing the body and the mind and the spirit mm -hmm. so that maybe one day when I go back into music, I have a different perspective of music. And I find that here at the river, like I still write songs like oh. and songs come to me, like little like folk, folk songs come to me and I'm, I'm, that's where I'm channeling my music right now is more of a form of, um, a form of prayer rather than something that I have to do for someone else. I love that. It's really just sitting by the river and allowing what I'm hearing in my head to become a tune or the bird that I'm seeing flying to be, it's like, po like I said, this place is poetry mm -hmm. for me. You know, I'm sitting here and I'm hearing sounds in my head and then writing that into words and recording the little bits of music on my phone and stuff yeah so i believe that nature has all it has mm. it all there at the end there is nothing more needed and if we look around here i mean this place is pure magic <laughs> when i arrived earlier today i could feel it it's so grounding the sun has not yet gone down and i can already feel i will have a beautiful sleep mm. what kind of sounds can you currently hear if you maybe Anthony, feel like closing your eyes. What is it that comes to your mind? Mm. I hear a bird across the river. Maybe it's hungry, calling for a family member to come back home <laughs> with dinner. <laughs> I hear the cicadas singing their songs, letting us know that it's mating hour for them really that's what they're saying they're ready to like get down and have some fun and you hear the constant call of the river she's always talking the river never stills and then i'm hearing this other animal Da -da -dun, da -da -dun, da -da -dun. It sounds like an alarm, like a car alarm. And this animal, I have yet to figure out what it is. It's, I've been investigating this animal for days because it's quite annoying to me. <laughs> um, and actually, that sound is really annoying. It's very high-pitched and my ear is really sensitive to it, but I don't know what the animal is. Oh. And then we have something else. It's screaming just showed up yeah what is that and now it's gone it's amazing as at the same time the Whoa. sun is going down and now you can feel the difference you mentioned it before we were sitting here this little river beach that you will recognize when the day is going and leading into the night the music of the jungle is different yeah the spirit changes the spirit of day goes to rest and the spirit of the night comes alive and the spirit of the day is quite still here it's a very still energy during the day and during the night it's actually very active even when you sit here at nighttime you don't ever see anything everything that you see is very still but if you close your eyes you can sense everything around you is alive and so there's a very strange energy here that is 
it's moving. It's moving during the nighttime. And I find that to be magical. And I think a lot of people miss that. But that's why I was telling you, you have to come down here at nighttime. Because that's when... Yeah, I don't know. There, the spirit that comes out in the, in the darkness here is... It's a powerful energy and it's very alive. Yeah. Alive, dead, movement, stillness. You just said the river is never still. Mm. What are your thoughts on stillness in life? I think stillness reveals us to ourselves. Is there stillness? Is this possible? Hmm. <laughs> no. <laughs> If I'm going to be like really scientific about it, then I'm going to say no, because the heart's always beating. Even when you're breathing, your chest is moving. But like this inner stillness, mm -hmm. yes, it is, it is something that exists. And that's the duality of life, right? That even when we are practicing stillness our body is still moving so there's always something active and there's always something um that's still there's always a yin energy and always a yang energy like what you said when you look around you think there's nothing moving but you hear it when you close your eyes that there is a lot of activity mm. going on you mentioned it before you are a loving man right yes oh yeah <laughs> <laughs> Have you never yes, tried? There's none around here. You're around? And you are the only man here around. No, literally. You... <laughs> It's fucking terrible. No. Since when do you know that? Oh my god, I was in the fifth grade. So young. So that's maybe like how old are people? I don't even know anymore. How old <laughs> how old are those little kids? I was a little kid. I, I mean I knew for a long time. For a long time I knew. I always knew when I was young that I was different because I was never hanging out with the guys. I was always hanging out with the girls. Always, and I grew up with a mom and two sisters, so I've, I've just always been more comfortable around feminine energy. Mm -hmm. And so, a lot of my uh, practice now is like tapping into the more masculine energy and finding that balance within because it's very natural for me to move towards the feminine side. And so, finding that balance uh, actually, opera has taught me that oh. because if I don't find the depth and the and the masculine in my voice, then I'm not able to project in an auditorium, you know? So that's why singing is a spiritual practice for me because it's a balance of light and dark, masculine and feminine in every character, you know? It's all of these archetypes and being able to embody them and stuff. What is masculine energy for you? Ugh. Oh, such a boring question. No, that's a hard question. Are you kidding me? I'm like, man, we are really Oh, look, this. look above. Look who's oh, showing up now. Luna. Yeah, she's been so bright the last couple of days. I'm telling you, it's her. And then the next is going to be a star right here. Oh, you really observe the sky, huh? Every, yeah, this is my home. <laughs> this is home. This is where we're all stardust. This is where we go when we, when we leave this place. That's where I'm going back to. Back to the masculine energy. Ah, I have okay. not forgotten that question. <laughs> um... You know, this is this is something that I have a, a lot of trouble actually speaking about because I, man, it's so hard for me. I, I, I don't want to push you into no, this, right? No, but I think it's really interesting to consider. And so I think what I will say about it is that I find <laughs> that the spiritual community is often like men have to be the divine masculine and women need to embody the divine feminine. And we're constantly forgetting that actually both are present and that we have to find that balance within us and that balance of divine masculine is groundedness right it's it's fire energy it's activity it's um adventurousness it's um production ambitiousness and i find that at least in america that's the energy that's constantly around us we don't have to practice that energy because it's part of the lifestyle you know We're constantly doing things. Our schedule is always full. We're, there's no stillness. We're always moving. The gym. Everyone is going... Well, not everyone, but the, the culture in America is like CrossFit, high-intensity interval training, right? Hit programs. It's, it's all about amping yourself up. That's what this like divine masculine energy is. And there's also, of course, the courageousness and 
the, I guess some people would say the protecting energy, but let's be real. The divine feminine will protect when she needs to, like she will come out and do her thing. So let's not forget that. Women forget too often about that. I would say. Um, yeah. Right. Um, I think so. Like the, the innate qualities in women that is motherly and protective, I think is intensely underestimated. I saw just recently, I saw a cow and she gave birth yeah. and the child cow was taken away. How do you say to a child cow in English? A fawn, right? Yes, a this fawn? thing was taken away, this beautiful animal, wow. not thing, but beautiful animal. And the mother cow was screaming. It was going crazy, right? So you could see it's not only linked to the humans, this power of protection, in particular when you are a mother. Why do you think women have not yet... A large majority of the women have not yet connected to that source within them. I mean, obviously, one reason might be it's just easy to lay on a man for protection or reasons. No, I really think it's because mm, mm, society teaches women to be quiet and mm. to be soft and to be gentle and to cover themselves and to not be promiscuous and to not cause attention or speak too loudly or anything like that and so the natural instinct to protect and to fight has has it's not so natural anymore and so this this we're, we're i feel that women are being encouraged to practice being strong and bold and independent and it's because they've been told for so long to rely on men you know and to be quiet and this is just a couple generations you know and so now we're we're un, unraveling that and unwinding that programming so that our women can come back into balanced alignment and hopefully we can challenge our men to do the same to find more of their divine feminine and to not because the more that the man feels that he needs to protect the women He's actually exploiting the women, right? Mm -hmm. He's exploiting the women and, and actually not allowing her to embody her feminine energy, mm, I think, when the, when the divine masculine is not balanced. It's actually overcompensating. Question for you. You just said like you're right now rediscovering or relearning your masculine energy so that it is balanced with your feminine energy. You said also that the opera helped you with that and that you carried a lot of feminine energy within you, which is maybe one reason why it's so great to be friends with guy people, mm. guy man, yeah. because you can connect without that sexuality thing in between somehow. How was it for you to feel then this feminine energy within you, which may be, I don't know, was also consisting of those aspects? It's fun for me. I love connecting to the feminine energy within me. The feminine energy within me wears this on my head, you know, this pink and purple on my head. It was so beautiful when I came down and I saw you there with this color up on your hair. Yeah, it, I like the divine feminine in me wants to wear colorful things. It wants to play dress up. It wants to put makeup on when I'm on stage. It wants to be the Knus Behexa and wear a wig. <laughs> Like that was so much fun for me playing that role. I was, I was wearing a corset oh, during really? that role and it was truly embodying like an elderly divine feminine. But even that role, she's a quite masculine character, the Knus Behexa. I mean, she's eating children. She's not the most feminine yeah. embodied yeah. human, but, um, the divine feminine energy in me just loves art and creativity and, Yeah, so a lot of my art and creativity is learning how to actually balance the masculine in there. And, and what does it look like for me to channel my masculine energy into my art? Because it's very natural for me to channel the feminine energy into my art. Like, that's just part of who I am. How do men react to that? Because we just spoke about women, and I think a lot of men are also quite separated from their feminine side. What is your experience when it comes to women, when they, uh, men, when they can see, that's what I wanted to say, when they can see you with your strong feminine energy? Is that still resulting into kind of complexity on the other side or 
I don't know. How is that? Yeah, that's that's a really interesting question. I think I used to be really uncomfortable with men when I was young because I wasn't sure how I would be received, you know, by men. And uh, growing up, it was all over the place. I mean, I experienced my fair share of bullying from men. So, of course, I grew up, like, kind of in fear of, like, how I would be received. But I think the more that I stand in my truth and the more that I stand in my balanced state of being... I think actually all genders are attracted to that, not in a sexual way, but I think people realize that, oh, like this energy is attractive because it's balanced, you know, like I want to embrace more of that. Mm -hmm. I think people do start to realize that because Mm -hmm. the people that inspire me, the males that inspire me are males Mm -hmm. that I find, regardless of their sexuality, have a balance of masculine Mm -hmm. and feminine, you know? So, um... Yeah, it's been really interesting. And I find nowadays that I guess men love me, but not in like a, not in a weird way at all. But yeah, I don't know. I don't get bullied so much anymore, but I also don't have a lot of many, I guess I I have a couple. (laughs) I don't know. Like, that's a really interesting question. I've never really, I haven't thought about that in a long time. But yeah, I feel like I'm, I am working on cultivating relationships with men more in a completely non-sexual way, just because for so long I shied away from it and would just be like, latch on to the nearest female that I find because it's just easier for me. So me putting myself outside of my comfort zone is like going up to a guy and starting a conversation And not fearing like, oh, are they going to think that I'm hitting on them? Or, oh, are they going to think this? Like, and just being like, no, I'm going to stand in my presence and just go cultivate a relationship with this masculine bodied person, you know? And, and I am like worthy of cultivating these kinds of relationships, even though growing up, I was told that I was unworthy, you know, in circles of men, you know? So it's like rewiring myself to feel safe and comfortable and yeah worthy around men thank you i am speaking about singing Mm. it's a way of speaking up right it's good to have a capacity here i cannot sing obviously and at the same time when i say that (laughs) i would say yes you can cocolina everybody assumes from themselves they cannot sing because maybe they made a bad experience when they were a very child Um, at the same time the more often I open up here I can feel there's something happening Mm. what would be your recommendation if you would be a singing teacher and you have a student like me who says I cannot sing, I cannot sing and you know it would be good for the other one to just give it a try Mm. what would be your key recommendation to just to dare it this is so funny that you use the word dare because when I created my voice studio for teaching, I called it dare, Ah, which is really funny. Yeah. But that's my thing. It's like when I work with people, I want them to dare to make sound, to dare to use their voice because we're constantly told, at least in America, we're told to be quiet, to not take risks, to not speak out because there's a fear of not being approved and not being received well. But when you're on the opera stage, you have to fill a 3000 seat, like space, you have to be courageous and bold with your voice. And so something that I find really helps people get out of their head and into their body is making primal sounds. Mm. So like grunting, moaning, howling, um, laughter, um, sighing, um, humming, all of these like primal sounds, sounds that, that we normally make. don't do, right? Well, when do you do well, this we do normally? That when we're babies, right? Ah, good point. Babies cry for hours and they don't have to be taught how to do that. You know, animals, animals cry, dogs howl, mm. wolves howl, a gorilla's grunt, and we can connect to these primal sounds that exist in nature and we know how to make it. If I ask you to grunt, you don't have to think about how to do that, you know how to do it. And your voice will do it. Maybe you won't do a full grunt because you're a little nervous. But if I can work with you to open up your grunt, then you feel safe and comfortable using your voice. And then maybe 
do you feel safe and comfortable expressing yourself to the world and stepping into your power? So I find when we can cultivate a relationship with our voice that is balanced, we actually become a balanced human because our voice is our body. You know, I can't go to the store and buy a better voice. I can go to the store and buy a better cello. I can buy a Stradivarius violin for $50,000 or $100,000, but you will never buy, you cannot buy a better instrument. Your instrument was perfectly made to make sound. We just have to remember how to make those sounds again and to release all of the thoughts in us that tell us I'm not a singer. I can't use my voice or I'm blocked or I'm this, I'm that. No, that is a blockage. This is the language that we have to get out of our heads so that we can just dare to make sound. Of course, that comes my next question. Do you have a most a preferable animal sound that, that you really like, that you would like to share with, here right now? I really love grunting. Like, it's so good. Go for it. Okay. I have, can I, like, squat down? I have to. You can squat down. I have okay. to keep the phone with you. <laughs> <laughs> Laughter is a great one, too. That's so activating. <laughs> And see, that's really activating this motion in the body, which creates sound. Or if you were to do a howl, you don't have to think about how to do that. Because our ancestors and the indigenous people are making this noise normally. It's in our blood to make these noises, but we've forgotten it. Exactly, and that brings me to the idea that we try to avoid that idea that we are pure animals at the end. Mm. We do everything. We even use a fork and a knife, right? It's the same. Crazy. To distinguish <laughs> ourselves from the animal world. It was beautiful. I love that. Mm. Thank you. Three more questions yeah, to end yeah. our little yeah, interview please. that happened again on a very spontaneous space. <laughs> This is part of how it should happen. <laughs> Getting back to the animal, what kind of animal would There's you? The star, I told there is, you. there is it coming up. <laughs> there it is, the star. I told you it was going to be here. It's beautiful now. It's like the jungle's already dark. It's alive. It's alive. You can feel it, right? I can. <laughs> what kind of animal do you right now want to be? I want to be a jaguar. <gasps> you're kidding me! I'm drawing jaguars you're these days. Wearing jaguar. Yes. I saw that. It's one of my favorite animals. The card that I pulled before I came here yeah. was Jaguar Medicine. Wow. And yeah, this is, this is an energy that I'm, especially here at this river in this jungle, that I mm -hmm. feel very connected to, even though there's no jaguars around, or at least I have not seen one. But yeah, there's something about this jungle that feels very jaguar, you know? How like you can see anything moving, but you can sense that there's something in the jungle that's alive. Hopefully I get safe back home. <laughs> <laughs> we'll walk together with a flashlight, don't worry. Speaking about connection, what's the most important thing for you when it comes to connect to a human being? And just a general connection. What is what you have learned about yourself? What is the most important piece that you need to be able to connect to humans? listening you have to listen to people but what is that what does that mean to listen it means to be still <laughs> circle close hey, i know right it's like and end the call <laughs> no but it's true like how do we listen we can't listen if our mind is active we can't listen if our body is active we can only listen when we are still Could have been good for an ending, but I have another one. <laughs> Keep it coming. I love it. How does God look like for you? Mm. God is in literally everything around me. God is... Oh my God, man. God is the fucking best. 
<laughs> God is in everything. God is in the food we make. God is in the the hands of the Mayan people who are making dinner for us right now. Like I feel God in the food that we eat here. I feel God in this river. I feel God in the darkness across. I feel God in the star up there. Like I, I really truly feel that spirit of life, the breath of God in everything around us and within too. It, it exists within us. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really woo woo, but <laughs> that's the best I've got for you on the on the topic of God. It's beautiful. Mm, thank you, Anthony. <laughs> this thank was amazing. So much. Thank you for pulling your phone out and for just <laughs> spontaneously doing this. Like we just had the most amazing conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, that was beautiful. And now let's go swimming into the dark river. Yes, right? let's take our clothes off and go swimming. Oh!